Welcome to Cross Platform Podcast, where we discuss how to solve productivity problems across platforms. I'm Augusto Pinot. And I'm Mark Elwix. And today we are going to start talking about the Mac. Yes, I have a Mac, even that my main machine is an iPad. And one of the few uses these Macs get is exactly what we're doing, recording podcasts. Mm -hmm. I, I record and edit podcast in, especially the recording, because um, I use an application called Crisp that helps with the noise, canceling the noise and really filtering the noise. And it's not available for any other than the Mac or the PC. I don't even know anymore if it's available on Chromebooks. Um, anyways, uh, I was sharing that when I upgrade from my old MacBook Air to the M1, many moons back, or, or some moons back, I start having an issue with the network card, even to the point that when I got the first M1, we have the issue, we have the issue, I talked to Apple Care, and the response from Apple Care was, please bring their machine back to the store and we will give you a new one. Okay, they replaced the machine. No, I mean, yeah, the machine was three days old. I get it, but but they were not. They 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 test with me. They we did remote. You know, couldn't fix it. Anyways, going, it's a problem and it's annoying because basically, I need to restart the machine or turn off. That, that the the recent discoveries I could instead of restart turn off the the network. Uh, card and then turn it back in. That made me thought, oh, what if I can fix it like a Windows machine? This is very sad. Okay, so I went to settings, networks, and delete everything related to that Ethernet port. Let it delete, restart the machine, and create the Ethernet port again. And now I have, again, a machine who likes to communicate with the Ethernet port. And and I'm very happy about it because other, I don't use the MacBook much, but it was very annoying coming in here and wanted to do something quick because was the machine in front of me and tried to do something, the connection is not working. It was very annoying. It's a really important thing, especially when you're working in an at-home environment to hone some basic troubleshooting skills for your hardware. Uh, I had a, a call today from a client who was having a very odd, I would say odd experience with his machine where he was saying that he was having to click on things three or four times to get them to do something, which regardless of the operating system, that's just weird. I mean, that's, right. there's no function in the operating system that's requiring that. So by going through some basic troubleshooting, uh, we were actually able to narrow it down that it was the batteries in his mouse that needed to be changed. But understanding the basic mechanics of the setup that you have and how do you go through and validate and how do you do these tests and how do you eliminate possible problems can go a long way to getting you back to doing the things that you need to be doing. Uh, in his case, he lost a couple hours you know, going through and he was restarting his machine over and over. I'm like, okay, that's fine, but you can stop doing that because that's not going to correct the problem that you're having. So, for example, in his particular case, the way to isolate that problem was to deter to start eliminating things. Uh, in this case, what we did is we said, all right, you have it. This is on a laptop. You're using an external mouse. Try your trackpad. See if you're having the same problem with your trackpad. Because what that does is if it duplicates the problem, it eliminates the mouse as the possible source. Right. If it works fine, now you've isolated it to a device. And that's really what you're wanting to do is go through and try to eliminate all the fringe possibilities to get down to, you know, as Sherlock Holmes would say, whatever is left, however unlikely must be the truth. Um, that's the, the process step. So getting comfortable with that, taking a little time to learn basic troubleshooting processes can really go a long way for that. So, and 
And that is very, you know, you make a very good point into what are the basic troubleshooting that you have, because it changed. If you have a Mac, you have a Windows, you have an iPad, you know, it changed. What are the basics and what are the things that you do? You know, I, my old aging parents, freak, okay, or one of them at least, freak. my mother will tinker with her laptop. My father will call me. So the thing is not working. Have you tried this? No, I called you first. See, well, and I have now in his office a uh, index card with five things. If do this, restart. If do this, you know. Mm -hmm. And before you call me, you know, try these five things. But what are those things that you think, or you have somebody that you call? Doesn't matter if it's your son, if it's paid, if it's free, it's irrelevant. What are those mm -hmm. things that you are? Because there, you notice these annoyances in those times that you are in a hurry. You know, I guarantee you that this person you are sharing today did not have two hours to waste on this mouse. Mm -hmm. Okay. And really what he wanted to do at the end of this troubleshooting was put the mouse in the trash with batteries and everything. Okay. Yeah. Out of frustration. So mm -hmm. that's, that's the part that is important. You know, I got a call um, from a client last week. He was having an issue with his pictures. Okay, on his iPhone mm -hmm. and his iPad. And and he was his initial thing was okay, I need to migrate everything out of the iCloud and move it to this and move it to that. And 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 we said, hold on, let's see where you are. Okay. And we went where he was in iCloud and say, we can do all that work and move all that, or you can just pay the 99 cents a month for, you know, having mm -hmm. you know, whatever is the storage that Apple give you for $12 a year. So he stopped for a second and said, sorry, can you repeat that? And said, yeah, well, we can do this and pay. And then he was very, you know, frustrated and said, so you're telling me that I can solve this in $12 a year and didn't need to call you? Yeah. <laughs> Basically, there, yeah. There's I, an, yeah, there's no yes, I'm not going that. to charge you for this call. That was my second sentence because what he was thinking on that second is okay. I'm going to pay X my my rate more my the 15 minutes of my rate okay for a problem that I could solve for 20 minutes for, for 12. Well, and the the thing to keep in mind too, and there is an old joke about this about you know the a plumber a plumber working at a facility retires and all of a sudden there's a problem on one of the motor or one of the the valve systems and they can't figure out what's wrong so they call the plumber back in and he's in there for like five minutes and he hits it one time and all of a sudden everything's working again and he sends them an invoice for like a thousand dollars and they question the invoice and the invoice breakdown says you know 900 or 10 minute or what was it 50 dollars for um work on the system and 950 dollars for knowing where to hit where, where to um, hit the and system. that's Right. Yeah. And that's that's exactly what this is. I mean, when you look at these kinds of circumstances where you're talking about this kind of troubleshooting, this is just something that is done over experience and time. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've been doing this 30 plus years. Uh, I know when things have certain behaviors, what they think they're doing and what's going askew in them. And I don't ask everybody to do that at, by any stretch. Uh, but there are some basic mechanics there are some basic troubleshooting that you can do on pretty much any system. Uh, one of the things that I do recommend is keep handy and you don't have to use it. Just keep it in a drawer somewhere, a keyboard with a wire on it and a mouse with a wire on it. Because some of the most common problems I see are wireless external device issues. Uh, conflicts with signal, power issues, any number of things can cause a problem. But just having one of those, and that those sets are cheap. That's like a $20 investment. Stick it in a drawer and it's, and it's available whenever you need it. You can unplug the wireless device, plug in the wired ones, and if you see the exact same problem again, now you know. 
you've eliminated two things right away as a potential problem. Then you can start building from there. Uh, the other thing that we see so much, and you see it all the time as well, when you're dealing with anything cloud-based, one of the first things you should do is check your internet connectivity. Almost always, unless there's a major outage happening or some sort of an outage on that system, the problem is between you and them. Mm -hmm. So being able to have, using sites like speedtest.net to do a check, to look at your speed network speed, to look at the upload speed and the download speed, and know what you're expecting to get uh, can go a long way in troubleshooting the problems. The other thing that I like to recommend for people for Windows especially and this is any PC or any machine, but, you know, restart the you know, machine. Before, before you jump to the yeah. windows, let me interrupt you for yeah. a second, because you said um, SpeedNet. And I've been recommending one that is called fast.com. And okay. the reason is SpeedNet gives you the upload, the download, mm -hmm. and most ISPs have great one of the two, okay? And normally mm -hmm. it's a download, okay? And then people don't understand, yes, if you get, you know, a download of a terabyte, but your upload mm -hmm. is very slow, there is no communication. Instead, fast give you one number, okay? As I tell, if your number is above certain threshold, you're good. But if not, then go back. And it make it simpler. Again, not for the geeks. The geeks one, spite now, you know, if we can get more data, even better. But for simplicity, all that I want to know if it's, this is fast enough, fast.com may be a good answer for that. Yeah. The the reason why I, I recommend speedtest.net for a lot of people is because it does give you two values. They're very simple, mm -hmm. big dial. One's the download speed, one's the upload speed. And you're absolutely right. Depending on your ISP, for example, Verizon, if you have fiber optic, um, your upload speed and download speed will often be the same. Whereas if you have a company like Comcast or Xfinity like I've got, you have an extremely high download speed, but your upload speed is significantly slower. Now, right. keep in mind, the upload speed from most machines is not really that critical. You're not pushing out a lot of stuff. I mean, unless you're doing heavy game streaming or something like that, you don't really have too much of a challenge there. But just looking at that, if you find and you know what your normal numbers should be, and then you run a test and you find that they're way off, that's usually a good sign that there's something going on. Could be something in your home network, could be something... Uh, within your connection to your ISP could be something at the ISP level. And that's where you start to, to do more diagnosing. But right. testing that out, and this is, again, where it's helpful to have another device, to grab an iPad, to grab a Chromebook and connect to the same site and see if you have the same issues. Um, that goes a, lot of, a long way for that troubleshooting. But where I was going with the Windows piece is Windows, you almost always get told, you know, restart the machine. So you'll go and you'll click on the Windows icon and you'll select restart and it'll, it looks like it shuts down and comes back up. Well, that's not actually a total restart. If you want a cold restart, which is usually what I'll recommend people get to, um, you close up everything that you're working on. Just make sure there's nothing that you're going to lose when you save. And you hold the power button down on your device until it turns off. Mm -hmm. Then you hit the power button and bring it back up. That way, everything is wiped out of the memory and it gives itself an opportunity to come back up because Windows can do a fast restart where it's not necessarily purging all the settings out of that session. Or in some cases, you have, especially if you're using a laptop, your laptop may be configured to not actually restart. It may be configured to go to sleep or to hibernate. So it looks like it, it's doing that clean get started, but it really isn't. And it can really throw off your troubleshooting process. But these are the kinds of things, and this jumps in a little bit to um, what I wanted to talk about today as well. These are the kinds of processes and procedures that you don't use very often. I mean, you, you'll have it. You may have to do it once or twice or maybe once every six months or so you run into this kind of problem. 
So how do you keep track of these kinds of procedures within your your space? So what I tell people for most of the, and, and I will make the distinction between this is at home or this is a client. If it's at home, okay, don't need to be complicated. It need to mm. be very simple, okay? In this household, there is four people, me and three non-IT people, okay? My two kids and my wife. And mm -hmm. so it need to be very simple. It's restart, it's unplug, okay? And I have a checklist. When the internet is failing, go and unplug the router in the office, count. 20 Mississippis. Do they need to count 20 Mississippis? No. Mm -hmm. But if I tell them five Mississippis, they will do one, two, three, four, five Mississippi. Okay. And then yep. it's not long enough. So you need to take that into consideration, make it a little bit longer, then plug it in again. And when it is business, I tell people create a folder, you know, create a basic folder that has those one page instruction. It could be online on a SharePoint, it can be online or it can be mm -hmm. just printed, okay? I have a page for guests, okay? Do we get guests often? Not really, okay? But it is really nice when we have people coming and I can go to the phone, go to the memos and then hit print, okay? And it mm -hmm. has the address, you know, it has the Wi-Fi. What is the password of the Wi-Fi for the guest? You know, and a couple of things that are close. Are they going to be alone? Honestly, I don't think any of them has used many of the things that are on that list other than mm -hmm. the password. Okay. But it is nice for for the for the people who came to visit to know that all that it is there. Okay. When my my kids' friends come, okay they know where the password is so they can share with their friends and they all can go online. And yes, I have a separate network for that because otherwise it gets very slow. But those are the kind of things that you want. You don't necessarily need to, okay, how do you rebuild a PC? Now, the moment you do that, you know or you don't, fine. But those basic things, because on the moment of the heat, you may not think on the three steps. Okay. Mm -hmm. In the moment that your network is down, okay, that's not the moment you want to say, oh, what are the issues? No, no, let's go pick. The reason I love checklist and I have loved checklist for so long is checklist is the process that you thought for when you mm -hmm. need to think. Because we think, oh, yeah, I will remember that. No, no. On the moment of the heat, you will not think on any of that. You know, we... We, for example, my wife and I have moved a couple of times and we have a checklist, okay? That is upgraded only if we move, but it has disconnect water, disconnect gas, disconnect utilities, but not utilities, it says disconnect internet, disconnect, start working on the connection of the internet for the new home. And all those, and that list has been built over us moving many times. Why? Well, because otherwise, you don't think about any of those things. It is like the packing list, okay? Do I have a packing list? And I have told this story before on a podcast. Um, I have my travel list, okay? Everything that I need to pack or that I may want to pack, okay? And that list has with me 20 years, has changed, had evolved, some products has come and go, great. I once, my wife was going to travel something for work and she's, can you share with me your list? Yeah, of course, forward to her. And then she called me from whatever she was traveling, very mad at me, of course. I said, well, you're mad at me. Well, your description of underwear is not precise enough. So I forgot my brass. Okay. <laughs> well, they were not on the list. I don't <laughs> use them. In my defense, okay, well, I don't you know, use them. All right. Them. Okay. Yeah. But... <laughs> That is the reason you want to have that list, okay? Mm -hmm. As I told her, grab the list now and add it because the next trip, you will grab the same list and forget again, or maybe, maybe not. But that is the reason of those, to learn from those experiences so you don't need to do it 
only once. I have a list that is called the default checklist. Okay. And the default checklist is unplug the hose. You know, those kind of things that you don't, that people tend to do after the pipe froze because they forgot to do it. And it has a task, okay, that comes in the end of September that says check the full checklist. And I have now one that is coming soon, okay, on March 1st, that is check the spring checklist. Okay. And sometimes I look at it and say, it's still too cold to do this. And sometimes, oh, it's good now, we can do it. But these are the things that I have thought I should do on the fall and the spring over the years. So I don't need to think again. I don't need to come to the spring and say, oh, well, what is what I want to do? No, I already know what is going to be the seven things I need to do now that the spring is coming. It's one of those situations where um, if you think about the the process of checklists and decision trees and flows and all, it's important to break down the type of thing that you're trying or type of process that you're trying to document versus how you're going to utilize it. So like you're talking about checklists, for example, checklists are one of those things that if you have anything in that listing that cannot be missed but there isn't necessarily a relationship between each thing in the item in the listing when it comes to process and stages then a checklist works great so packing's a great example uh shut down for a seat the end of the season you know those kinds of things where you just need to make sure that everything gets done Checklists are a great way to do that. And checklists are fantastic for anything that has to be done more than once. Mm -hmm. As you were talking about, you know, house moves and things like that, or, you know, troubleshooting or packing things up. I'm working on updating my packing list now because I'm going to be doing some international tra travel in the next month. That's really important because you only get one shot at packing that stuff up and making sure you have it taken care of, you know, and being my clear, grandma, and my being grandfather, defined. my grandfather, as well as my father-in-law, will have told you that you only need passport and a credit card with enough limit. You don't need to worry about anything else. <laughs> uh, okay, you know, I could, I could make that argument. That's not going to fly for me, yeah. but not fly for me either. But that's what they always said. The other thing is. Now, sorry, I'm going to interrupt you on things related to that. I'm going to give this to my father-in-law because the first time we traveled together, I mean, we were very, we were young and I were just married. So, you know, financially we were where young people is. And we went shopping and he was, you know, buying stuff as a gift for my wife. And I started getting anxious because I thought that, was what he was giving her, we were going to pay excess of luggage. Okay. Mm -hmm. And on my house, on my household, when I was a kid, for my dad, that was a model scene. Okay. <laughs> you, you don't do that. And so I'm getting anxious into this. He looked at me. So what happened? And then my wife told him, well, on his house, you don't pay for excess of luggage. And that is a no, no. So he's anxious about the fact that we are going to pay for that. And then he looked at me and said, well, how much do you think we're going to spend on this trip? Okay, $100. Okay. You think if there is any difference between $100 in this trip or $110 in this trip and include the excess of luggage as part of the cost of the trip? Mm -hmm. And that really opened my eyes because I have never thought about that on on that perspective, hey, why I'm going to ruin the trip, okay, because we find something that you wanted or I wanted or we bought or whatever, because now we need to pay to take it back. We ruined mm -hmm. that moment. We ruined the moment on the airport and we ruined the, the enjoyment of that thing. Mm -hmm. So it was a good teaching and it was a good teaching that I applied to many of these things, you know, is yes, make the list. Yes, check it twice. But if you get to anywhere and discover, oh, I failed and I forgot this, 
don't make a big fuss about that. Mm -hmm. Just add it to the full. Don't think of, oh, now I need to buy a USB C cable because I forgot mine. Just add it to the full cost of the trip and let it be there instead of ruining the good moments of the trip because of that. Yeah, I, I find that when you start to look at the scale and impact of certain decisions, um, things like that, you know, am I going to pay extra for the luggage? Are we going to do this? Are we going to do that? Uh, that can really, it can be confused with a myopic view of, okay, I'm going to save a few dollars here, a few dollars there mm -hmm. until you back up and you figure out exactly what the true cost of that is. You know, am I going to have to take time out of wherever I am, which we know that time period is limited just by the fact of being there to do something that I could do now and take care of. And yes, it may cost me a little bit here, but it's actually going to be at the end of the days more expensive to do it there because it's taking away from my time wherever I am. Mm -hmm. So when we think we were talking about checklists and I think this builds to another step, another level up of this is this idea of having flow charts, flows of these processes you know, how you go through step one, step two, step three. And these are the kinds of things where there is a relationship between the things that have to happen. This has right. to happen first. This one has the second, third, fourth. What I find interesting about this is people often will look at these, and I, I have to admit, I did myself for a long time, look at these as two separate things. You'll have a flow chart or you'll have a checklist. Well, that's not necessarily the case. If you start to think about it three-dimensionally, you can have a flow chart where the various steps in the workflow are checklists. So for example, step one may be, you know, this critical path of planning your trip. Step one may be, you know, your pre-trip planning. That's the first step in the flow. Well, that pre-trip of pre-trip planning, I can't even can't even say it may have several stages in that. And each one of those stages has a checklist of things that has to occur. Now, it could be a situation where everything on that checklist has to be done before you move to the next step. Or it could be one of those open checklists that has to be completed before all of it gets done. You, you have to look at those pieces. But by nesting those together, now you can take this flow series of steps and put the decision points in there. Am I going to take an extra suitcase with me or am I going to buy a suitcase there to fill up with stuff and bring back? Am I going to take my noise canceling headphones or am I going to take wired headphones? And those kinds of decision points can then be fed into the checklist to track. And it, what we're talking about here is a growing complexity and we're talking about travel, but this applies to anything when you have things to do. Uh, I, I'll give the comparison when we talk about like this episode and these shows, I have a checklist of things that need to occur to publish this episode through YouTube and through Spotify. However, there's a flow that goes along with that as well. Because each one of those stages, you know, publishing and Spotify, that's a stage in the flow. But that stage has multiple steps in it, checks in the checklist. Now, some of those do have a, a relationship to each other. And I have those clearly indicated in the checklist. You know, if you're an old project manager, you, it's this idea of a pro, uh, critical path. These are the things that must occur to get to the end. But those combinations... Now we're talking about a fairly complex thing. How do you how do you actually document it? I know you're a mind mapper. Um, do you use mind mapping for these kinds of things? Do you use flow charting? I know you use checklists, but what other kinds of tools are you working with? And I want to talk about the tools I'm using. So I am a mind mapper and I like mind maps a lot. I like even... And I like, I prefer a mind map than an outline. That mm -hmm. said, that's me. And one of the things as a consultant is not what works for me, but what worked for the client. Mm -hmm. And 
And that's what is comes useful in this conversation. For me, they're checklists. And from checklists, they go, if their complexity is that much, then they go to a mind map. And from the mind map, most likely they come back to a checklist or a series mm -hmm. of them. That said, for clients, that change. And the quest, first question is, where are you going to check this? Because I have seen sometimes clients who go into these wonderful ideas and create these boards. And they say, that's beautiful, but where are you going to check this board? Well, when I'm on the field, also you are going to bring that board, that mm -hmm. or you're going to bring a picture or how you are going to look that picture to be able to look at all this. And, and I tell the story with, with a client of mine who we came to an audit, okay? Nothing mm -hmm. out of the ordinary. The difference was that as I was helping them to get some of the stuff, I told them, why, how do you expect this person to understand this process? Mm -hmm. And they look at me like, we're trying to explain this. So we built a flow chart, okay? Not a right. mind map, a flow chart. Okay, this is what it needs to be. Okay, and we put, as you said, the points where the, the checklist were a little bit longer. And we present to the auditors that was the evidence they were requesting. Okay. And the response from the auditor was, this is the first time we understand your process and we've been auditing you for five years. Now we understand that some of the things were requested to you doesn't make sense. Mm -hmm. But it's, so it is the fault of the auditor or it is the fault of the company? Neither, okay? The, the auditor was asking what they understood and, you know, Normally you get a new auditor every year because they're normally junkie kids and it's what it is. So that's where this checklist, this process, these mind maps come to be very, very, very handy because you can now give a person who has zero knowledge about the next steps to be able to accomplish them, to be able to finalize them, you know? So those are the kind of things that you need to, you know, when you look at the show, you were mm -hmm. talking about the show. Well, there is a full checklist. Okay. Then this is what needs to happen in the pre-show. This is what happened in the show. This is what happened. Okay. Now I can share. Okay. We get, we, and you adjust. Okay. We test initially with a piece of software. Now we're testing with Zoom. Okay. And, but the steps tend to be the same. Okay. You go to somebody, download the Zoom, and then August is waiting for the link that it will be mm -hmm. unlisted. Then he publish on PPC before it gets released to the public. And three days later, that link goes public. Great. But all that process need to be documented. So if Augusto is sick and he texts Art and say, can you take care of the episode this week? Art, all that it needs to go is look at the process right. and go. And that's where most people are afraid. What I found is that people is afraid. Well, but if I show them that procedure and how easy it is for me to get it done, they will replace me. Okay. Yeah, and, and I and I have heard that on on the on business many. It's times. a long, it's a long, long running thing within business, mm -hmm. that fear and that control of knowledge because that's what makes you irreplaceable. But we all know very well that it doesn't matter what you know you are replaceable. So don't don't think that's going to save you anymore as compared to what it used to. Um, but looking, you're right, documenting the things for, especially working within a team are critical because if somebody does have to step in and take care of a process, it's important that it be uniform, consistent, and clear. I think it's just as important for your own things, especially the things that you don't do often. The infrequent things are the ones that are more often you are going to delude yourself into thinking, I remember all the steps. Or worse yet, you'll be doing it and you'll think you can put in a shortcut. Oh, I this just this was too complicated. I can just shortcut this. There's a reason why you wrote that procedure out in the first place with those steps. And if you've gone through and you've tested it, and sometimes things change and you can revise and you can alter the procedure, but there are, again, a reason for those steps. I like the idea of mind mapping. I think mind mapping is an ex extremely powerful tool, especially to get 
that 30,000 foot view of something that you're working on. So for example, like with the show, I have a mind map of all of the different things that need to happen with an episode and with the show itself. So some branches talk about episodic publishing. Some branches talk about uh, write-ups. Some of them talk about administration of the show episodes. And then they get into the flow of what that particular step is. So if we talk about episodic publishing, there's a flow of the steps necessary to publish. And that flow is about that 10,000 foot level. It's you know, upload the file to Canva, make the modifications and edits, pull it down and load it up to YouTube. But then within each one, there's a checklist of very granular steps because I don't want to miss out on anything because I get into an automated process that's not really automated. It becomes mechanical. I'm like, okay, I'll click here, I'll click here, I'll click here, I'll click here. I can easily miss a step if I don't have those. And I've written an article about this before, um, this concept of microtasking. Get it to a level of detail where it's like, yeah, you clicked this, you check it off. You clicked this, you check it off. Why? Because you make sure you clicked all the things. Because it's that one thing you didn't click that almost always comes back to burn you in the end. So being able to take all that and then store it and then leverage it and draw on it when you need to as an individual is a lot of upfront work that has to happen that pays very large dividends in the long run. In a business or in a team, that's a lot of perpetual work that does not necessarily look like it translates to uh, direct revenue or direct execution or moving milestones or things like that. It's the type of thing that keeps things rolling. But you can't say that, okay, updating this procedure and keeping it current generated X amount of revenue. No, nah, that's a harder conversation to have. And it's often one of the reasons why that type of an exercise gets devalued, even though it's one of the most important exercises that you can do. So, you know, as you were as you were sharing this, you you make me think on on other kinds. And uh, as part of have the honor of being the tech support of the family, okay, <laughs> as I know you do, okay. Mm -hmm. Part of the issue sometimes is not being the tech support for the kids or the wife, okay, because they are more close to technology. But mm -hmm. the older people, you know, the, yes. the, the mother-in-law, the, the parents, the uncles. And and funny enough, when uh, WhatsApp, WhatsApp is very heavily used in Latin America. My mother-in-law lived in Mexico. And so when the two-form authentication came, I create a guide. Okay, And I have created mm -hmm. many guides to how to use the iPhone for her. Okay, Because one, it's very hard for me to do it myself. Uh, because of the distance and it is painful to try to get her on the phone and say click in here click in there it's much easier with the pictures and she can do it and call me if there is something the same thing with whatsapp what i didn't know until very recently was there was somebody else who was having an issue with two-form authentication so a friend of my mother-in-law and then i was asking some questions and the answer she gave me was well I give him your guide and he did it that way. So okay. you don't know where these guys or where these steps can also inspire other steps and other things. It's um it's really worthwhile when you when you write up these kinds of procedures, especially if you're doing it for for non-technical people or if you're doing them you know, pretty much for anybody else. Mm -hmm. If you think about them as never seeing it again, they have never seen it before and they will never see it again. So it's a once and done type of thing. How is that information clear enough that they can do it without you there? And if you need an equivalency, think about it like an Ikea guide. If you buy a piece of Ikea furniture, 
that guide is so painfully clear and so basic uh, that pretty much anybody can follow the steps, turn an Allen wrench and put together an end table. Right. There are some great tools for this, especially if you have online materials that you need to share with somebody, whether it's personal or professional. Uh, one of the tools I use quite a bit is a tool called Scribe, which allows me to record in real time as I'm working with a website or an application or something on my computer. And it captures all of it. And then it allows me to go back through and add notations in, um, put the steps together. And then I can send a link that'll actually walk somebody through those steps in just a real recorded format or export it as a PDF file and send them a printed, you know, printable guide mm -hmm. to accomplish the type, types of things. What's nice about that tool, especially from a, a professional standpoint is you can save those and you can use them again and again and again. So if you create it to be generic enough that it can be used by multiple people, you only have to create it one time and then you can keep reusing it over and over and put those guide sets together. Uh, you're right with the, the family troubleshooting piece. I think one of the most important things, and it's something that I've always had a challenge with, but I think it can help people if they do this is help explain to people when they should stop trying to troubleshoot. When, how far should they try on their own before their efforts are actually going to make it harder for you to help them? So for example, I'll take the example from today. Somebody going through and doing six reboots on a computer and clicking you know, eight times in these various places, right. that doesn't help me troubleshoot anything. All you're doing is disguising the symptoms. Uh, the best, you know, there are basic things you can do. Do the following. Reboot. Check this, check this, check this. If all of those things fail, stop. Call me. That's the type of thing. Because at that point, if they've done that, and we all know lots of people who will call and say, yeah, I did that. You know, especially, you know, the classic first level help desk. Have you rebooted your machine? Yes. When did you do that? 1983. I mean, that's the the type of thing where you have to say, okay, stop. You're not helping anybody with these things. Um, being able to ha help them understand that framework and understand that process helps you out as well. Because then you know what, can have occurred to get to that particular point but the more random things that are done to try and solve the problem those are more things that you have to eliminate and that's where i go back to that the process documentation and the checklist and the workflows being able to have your own checklist and workflow uh, one of the things i always do is if it's not a critical system failure where the thing's just blue screening and blowing up one of the first things I'm going to do when I go in there is I'm going to pull open task manager and see if anything has the, the processor pegged or the memory pegged. I'm going to go through and make sure you're current on, on your updates. I'm going to make sure you're current on your application updates. If all that is solid, if your internet connection is solid, I've eliminated 80% of the likely pro causes. Now I can start to focus on those weird things and have to poke and click on things and run repair applications and that sort. Um, but that that uniformity of it is really important so that you have that, that consistent behavior. And I think it also helps people if they know how far they're going to try and how far they're expected to, to try and not go any further. So for example, when I worked in a corporate environment, and they had their own dedicated IT teams. And they actually had dedicated IT desks in the buildings. Uh, and let's say my laptop was acting up. I would take it down there. And having done this, I would be able to tell them, yes, I've done the following things. You know, I've rebooted it. I've checked the applications, that sort of thing. And that's where I'd stop because I know anything I did beyond that was not going to aid them any. Right. Because either they were going to have to do it anyway, or it wasn't going to tell anything to anybody. So at that point I just said, okay, fine. So let's, let's talk a little bit though. I, the reason why I'm, I'm really kind of jumping on this whole procedure checklist flow chart thing right 
today is I've been going through an exercise this week, starting to do a digital purge of redundant systems. Uh, we've talked about this in the previous couple of episodes where my focus this year is really on simplifying. And one of the great arch nemesis, 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 I don't know, yep. of simplification is redundancy. Because redundant systems, if you try to keep them active and current, means you're doing double and triple work in many cases. And it's just a complete waste of time. So right. being able to, to boil these things down and turn them into logical, documentable processes and procedures is, a, it's a big effort. I mean, I have to admit, I'm going through quite a bit of an effort to start to identify these things and flag mm -hmm. this set of notes that I've taken here. This really should be a checklist. Wait, this checklist is complicated enough. It should have a flow chart because there's decisions that have to be made as part of the checklist. This thing, this flow chart is big enough that it really should have a mind map that's going to guide all of the different flows that are interconnected around this initiative. And now, can this be used again? And that's the other part I wanted to discuss a little bit. Um, I was looking at an article on, where was it? I think it was in the OneNote for Professionals Facebook group. And somebody had posted that they were having a, a problem. No, it was dealing with Notion, actually. It was dealing with Notion. And somebody was talking about the fact that they didn't understand how someone could possibly charge $70 for a Notion template. Now, the template was to build one of these life management systems, whatever. Right. But they didn't understand how you could possibly charge $70 for something like that. When most of the time, you'd be surprised to see things for $10 for these digital templates. And it raised an interesting question in my mind. And that's the build versus buy art argument when it comes to these kinds of processes and systems mm -hmm. and all. Does it, when does it make sense to go find something that's already been built? And if there's a cost to it, pay that money. Or when does it make sense to maintain that DIY mindset and build it yourself? Do you have any thoughts on that? You know, it is difficult because there are two or, or more than one element there. Where are you? Do you have the skills to build it? Okay. Mm -hmm. And that's the first question because we yeah. think, okay. And second, you have the money to pay. And, but the first one is, do you have the skills to build it? Because sometimes we think, well, but I don't. I want this, but I don't know how to build it. Well, you don't have the skills. So there is somebody who already, theoretically at least, went to the trials and error to make that work or could make mm -hmm. that work for you. The second situation is where I don't have the skills, but I don't have the money. Well, mm -hmm. then that is that is one. I am, I am a bad software person, okay? And why? Because I like basic software. Mm -hmm. Why I like basic software, because when you get very complex one and things change, then it stop working. Okay. When I recommend software, you know, I, I do for a small business and we work in NUSPE. Okay. And I'm a consultant or an expert. And why do I recommend that? Because you can make it work in so many ways without learning a new software and that's mm. something that you need to know and to understand how you can work into this you know in the ipad i recommend a software called good notes good notes allows you to upload pdfs create your own notebooks all that great but it is so flexible that you can really do so much with it and that's something that you need to be careful sometimes we spend years building something for the business or a reality to change 
and now that thing to be a waste or even to get to the point that now we outgrow the system we built mm -hmm. and now they go to the new system is such a big leap that we then get stuck into the system that we have. No, I, I agree with, with you completely on that. It's so easy to get into that focus point of saying, okay, I have documented this, therefore this is what it is. And we lose that context of often that it needs to change. As the rules change, we have to adapt with it accordingly. Uh, and that's one of the things, especially in a professional environment where it can fall by the wayside. And it's like, I got work to do. I can't spend my time documenting or updating these documents. And as soon as they're old, out of date and inaccurate, the only thing that's worse than a non-documented procedure is an incorrectly documented procedure because right. you're just asking for trouble. And I give people this example many times. Think on your office. Doesn't matter if it's your mm -hmm. cubicle, doesn't matter if you have an actual office or you have a home office, doesn't matter. Okay. What are the procedures that you never documented about the office? Well, it's my office, okay. No, if you pay attention, okay, you have a procedure. When you get a piece of paper that goes to a mm -hmm. particular place, could be an inbox, could be a pile. It will depend people to people where that goes. There is a procedure in your mind. You may have mm. never documented, but there is a procedure in your mind. And what happened when that procedure gets broken? You add a piece of technology, you remove a piece of technology, something changed on your day-to-day. -day. Now you need to fill one more form. Hey, mm -hmm. now you got promoted and instead of spending three hours in calls, you're spending 10 hours in calls. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. How that change when you allow all these procedures to be unconscious, it's very, very hard to find where is the bottleneck and what is broken. You know, yes. when you look at the office, if I show you my office right now, okay, I am in the process of that a couple of things. Why? Well, exactly because of that. There is a thing that was added, okay, that break the workflow. Okay, then what are you going to do? The procedure is established. So I went, look for the mind maps, print them. Okay, and I've been looking now, you know, walking with, mm -hmm. I'm going to do this. Oh, oh, here, park it in here. Okay, but if you don't have any of those things documented, then it's very hard. When I coach people in their weekly review, okay, in the getting things done, methodology with review, I always tell them, people go to this checklist from the, the book and say, well, get get ready. Hold on. What that mm -hmm. mean? Well, it says here, clear the inbox. I say, great. What are your inbox? Oh. Well, my inbox, my email inbox. Great. What else? Well, where do you put stuff at home? Where do you put... and it comes to, well, I don't have a place at home where I put my own stuff. So your home is your inbox. Okay. Where do you put them in the car? Well, I just throw it in the back, in the back. Oh, then trunk, you need to check. And is that difficult? No, it is not. But when you put home as an inbox, okay, that's the moment that you realize, well, I can really be a lot more effective into this, getting a folder, getting a bag. Okay. I get it. And, and and I remember a client who said, if I put an inbox, a plastic inbox in my home, my wife will kill me. Okay. And, and I said, that's fine. Can you buy a bag? And he looked at me and say, hold on, you have two kids. And say, yeah. Where your kids put the backpacks? Oh, when we enter the home, there is a hook that they have for their backpacks. I say, great. Talk to your wife, ask for a third hook, buy a cheap bag, hang it in there and ask that everything that is related to you gets dumped into that bag. Okay. That is the same inbox. The inbox doesn't need to be a plastic square. It just needs to be a fixed place where everything gets there. For this particular client, issue solved because when Amazon delivered the box and the wife opened it and say, oh, this is for my husband, close it and put it exactly there. 
when he gets home, he can decide I'm going to deal with the inbox or not. But it is not any longer the house as an inbox. And we don't think how this change this apply, but this is the same thing with a processing order or a sales order or a server that you're going to fix. Doesn't matter what your job is. At the end of the day, it's a step one to a step whatever. And if you let them to be unconscious, your opportunities to improve are very, very reduced. Yeah, when you've got multiple threads as part of your process and like you're identifying inputs into your inbox, that's where your process kind of unravels to start. Because when we think about those capture points, let's say, for example, receipts, I'll just use that's <laughs> that's one of the, the challenges that I have all the time is keeping track of receipts because I'll, I'll get a receipt and I'll stick it in my pocket or I'll stick it in my jacket pocket or I'll stick it in my notebook or I'll stick it in my bag. Now I have to go and gather them for all these different holding places because they're not actually capture. They're kind of just literally parking spots. Then they have to be put into the capture process. Well, that's where, for example, when, when you look at this kind of information management, one of the tricks that I've seen and I've, used on occasion and i should actually probably use more frequently is this idea of digital capture physical storage so for example if it's receipts as soon as i get a receipt do the digital capture of it and then all the receipts go in a box for that month why because the only time i need to get to them is if i should ever actually have to get to the physical receipt mm -hmm. so they can just go in that box they don't have to be filtered and organized and sorted and cataloged within the box because i can do all of that to the digital copy of it that i've now put into my system in this case captured with my little with my phone so that when i think about that process flow and that workflow diagramming and being honest with myself as to where are all the different places that receipts are going to show up where are the how where do they all get captured well the information enters the digital part of the system the physical media enters the physical storage part of the system and then you can start to look at that over and over and over again because if you can do it with one can you now reproduce this process with other things? Mm -hmm. Mail coming in, bills coming in, documents, you know, owner's manuals, whatever. That type of thing can go a long way. So building these kinds of layers into your system, this is one of the things that I'm actively looking at right now from what, what needs to be managed at what level and then brought from that level down starting at that top most one. So for example, uh, I've talked about in the past couple of episodes, I've been <laughs> actively working to get Google AdSense enabled on my website. Well, I got notification today, finally, that Google has f blessed my site and said, yes, you can do this now. So that means that that whole process, those series of checklists I had to get it turned on are all completed and out of the way. That part of the flow can actually be pruned off now. But now a whole new part of the flow has to be added on to my daily routines of checking the analytics and make sure making sure there aren't any problems and looking at the content that people are interested in and making sure I'm writing that kind of content so that it's getting you know the proper views and the proper feedback. That changes that flow and that goes to what we were talking about. So now when I say, okay, I'm going to write articles for the site. Every article that goes in there as part of its long-term lifespan has an evaluation from an AdSense perspective. And mm -hmm. that's that modification, that evolution of those workflows. And that has to be documented because there's no way I can keep that in my head. I've got to write that down and I've got to structure it in a way that I can then go into it as if it's the first time I've ever gone into it. If I'm being freshly trained on that thing, and these are the steps I need to take. That is correct. 
All right. So what other projects um, I've been, I was talking about a couple of mine, what projects do you have on the radar right now? Well, um, I mean, there is no more change from, from last week other than, as I said, the workflows for my home office or my office are broken. So I rearrange in some stuff um, to be able to bring back the optimal workflow of things. I don't have a lot to share today about that. I'm just, uh, it's something that I'm working. I, um, my friend, Michael Slewinski used to do uh, an exercise where he pulled everything out of his office and then bring back item by item until he, mm -hmm. you know, to, to get rid of all those things that you have in your office that are, you know, they're there because you at some point have it used and move it. So um, that it was, I always thought it was a very interesting exercise. Mine is not that deep. I'm just trying to improve a couple of things on the workflow um, and the desk. And uh, hopefully by next show, I will have a lot more to share. And, but part of what break it is, you know, we share in the last episode, I talk about the Vision Pro. Well, I'm working a lot more in the Vision Pro. So that How's that going make, for you? I'm, Have... It's been fantastic for for what I do, the, the, the writing, the work, you know, those things, it is great. So um, the, the persona, as Apple called him, is not well received everywhere, but that's fine. <laughs> I can always turn the camera. Okay, but um, but for work, but that also means that the setup, okay, if I'm going to write a lot more with those massive screens or the ability to access those larger screens or even having, do I really need the setup that I have or well, not? That's a good point. That's a good okay. question. So that's part of what is evaluated. It's not only where the tool fits, but in the short, mid and long term, really, do I need the office that I have? Okay, or the setup that the office have. That's a okay. that's a big change to make to your environment based on one piece of hardware. But I could, yeah, I can recognize that. Well, and then that is the thing. You know, I had I had always have this area to work, and then I have another area to write. Mm -hmm. okay, great. Do I want to keep that? Do you know there is a project that we talk about, Nosby Consulting that is coming, do I really need those two areas or do I need one or do I need a different area? You know, one of the things I've been looking is on this wall behind me is empty right now, but do we need to keep it empty? Or do I want to get a different camera to some of these videos that I'm filming and shooting so that mm -hmm. the information is there? Or do I want to do all instead of video just with backgrounds and then that means you need to work and learn how to measure the background so you can really work on the backgrounds and don't cover them as you work. So right, it's part of that workflow, nothing complex necessarily, but if you make it unconscious, you don't have an ability to improve it later. No, I, I agree with, with you completely there. Those kinds of changes, those can be seismic changes in your environment to make that big of a physical adjustment. And it, it can really change not only the small ways of how you do work, but it can change the type of work that you do, period. And I think that's, I'll be very curious to hear how that works over time to see, you know, do you stick with that? Do you find, has it created better workflows and better working opportunities with that particular type of tech? Yeah, um, and for example, my case, the, the Vision Pro is the computer that comes with me now inside mm -hmm. of the house. Um, is a Vision Pro and, and the iPad mini. The iPad mini is my main machine and is where the machine that I read and do other things. So those two machines are now with me a lot more. And it's funny enough, I, I have um, my back now, I'm looking, okay, I I order another insert uh, from Waterfield so I can have the Vision Pro in there. Oh, okay. The, the inserts, the bag is fantastic, Well, but it needs to work. Is 
And that's what I tell people when we talk about these cross platforms is when it is not just, oh, I need a new phone or I'm going to get a new phone mm -hmm. or I'm going to get a new computer is how these tools are going to improve and break your workflow. Because on certain things, the Vision Pro has improved tenfold already the workflows. In others, it has broken. Okay, for example, uh, working with Nosby or working with To is is great to input information, but it's not as great to organize. I can't okay. do that much faster with a mouse. All right. Okay. So, okay, that means I can do. For example, I tried to do my weekly review on them. Okay, mm -hmm. it wasn't easy, fast to move and organize. So, okay, take it out. Doesn't work for that, but. That also means that I invest a certain amount of time during my weekly review to, to make that thing work. That that make for that day a longer weekly review. But also, okay. what were the things that fail? Because as the technology continue evolving, okay, are these things going to improve? And I can tell you an example. When the first iPad came out, if you wanted to attach something to your email, you start with the attachment. So you okay. open the picture, send to email, and then you oh, yeah. send it. There was no way to attach it from the email. Okay, Now there is, but at that time, there was not. Great. But if you don't think about those things and you don't document it, you have no way to know when the technology changed that that is not needed anymore. Yeah. And that's that's something that's interesting with, with this type of tech is it's that catch-22 how much of a change do I make to my processes and procedures to optimize around a particular new piece of technology for the sake of that technology? So you were talking about, you know, you're doing your daily or your weekly review with the Vision Pro and having to change some of those steps. If you decide at some point, I don't want to use these anymore, they're just not going to cut it do you have to revert your processes back to a different okay. structure? And that's, there's that benefit loss as to, is it worth doing? Is it not worth doing? And I'm not saying one way or the other. I'm saying that's a, a an evaluation factor that has to come into play when you look at it. And that's what you need to analyze, you know, and I will give you an unexpected, you know, benefit. I, my kid mm -hmm. goes to baseball uh, lessons on Sunday morning. Okay, great. I go there. I sit there for, for two hours, but it's inside of um, a warehouse. So you cannot see the kid. You cannot do anything. Okay, so you have two options. You drive home. Okay, but it is on that threshold where driving home is not worth it. Okay, because it's 25 minutes. So it's 50 minutes come and go and the class is hour and a half. So Mm -hmm. Is worth 40 minutes in my world is not. Okay. I can work perfectly fine remote there. But the before the visions pro, I needed to find that perfect spot where I can hide from the sun so I don't have yes. the sun in my face. Okay. With this, doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. Because you don't get, yes, I can see from the camera that there is sun, but I can also close it and I don't see it. And the fact that the sun is eating my face doesn't blur me because it's looking through the camera and not directly. Oh, yeah, me. that's a good point. That's a okay. that's a very so good point. On Sunday, I was able to work for 90 minutes straight without even being bothered by the sun. I'm going mm -hmm. to still say drinking coffee with that thing, it is complicated. <laughs> okay. <It's, laughs> I am still I struggling <laughs> with that. But does does Apple Care cover that just out of curiosity? I if, have no if the clue. coffee goes too high, so I have no clue. I hope I don't need to find out. But that's that's when you need one of those Stanley mugs with the big straw. Then you can just with a big work. straw. Yeah, but coffee yeah, and they... a straw don't go together. I just I'm just trying to solve problems. You know. I know, I know, but coffee and a you straw. You get the vision, the together. Vision Pro crazy straw that that like loops around it. And loops around the... There you go. That's what you need. That's there's coffee. there's the, a the, whole the Apple China... product line. There is a whole Apple product line, but those are the kind of things. And that's where we have said in here and we have talked in this show about my technology card. When I got this device, okay, there are very specific things 
that I'm checking, okay, really, can mm -hmm. this device replace anything, okay? And what can replace or not, right? right? I understand I have a very clear thing, plus I have the ability that I'm playing with the technology because at the end of the day, that's how I'm going to serve my clients better, okay? Mm -hmm. But I can play with that thing and never use it, okay? And being able to know, you know, I have I have a PC in the side of, on the left side of my office. I know how to use a PC. The only mm -hmm. reason that thing exists is because I have clients which main machine are PC. And when they come right. with something weird, I need to be able to go and open my PC and see where they are looking at. So it is the same thing, you know, Zoom, for example, I've been telling this for, for a while now to people, when you are doing troubleshooting on people on the phone, again, especially parents and stuff, uh, and, mm -hmm. or in my case, also my sisters, tell them, okay, let's open a Zoom call. And they look to you very weird, but they can share the screen on the phone. So you can now tell them, click here, click here, click here, solve. Because otherwise you will tell them, go to settings. Oh, my phone has no settings. No, no. The thing <laughs> with the gears. Yeah, I have no gears. Right. I cannot find it. Okay. So those are the kind of things. And for me, the test of this device comes with, okay, can this device do this task? Okay. These are main important tasks for me. Can mm -hmm. they do it? And so far... It has done in an incredibly way. Okay. Then after that, then they may replace devices that way or process that way. Then now it is worth it for me to try other things that I do. And in some things they will do very well. And in some things they will not. Yeah, there's there's no question about it. I think we're going to wind up exploring this quite a bit more. Um, actually, next week, I want to talk a little bit about how I want to talk a little bit more about the mind mapping piece of this because I think people's understanding of what mind mapping tools are, how they work, how they can be put to use is really, really eye opening for a lot of people, especially creatives. Um, people who like a very organized structure can sometimes struggle with mind mapping a little bit, but people who are just liter are very creative will lean into it hard so let's let's leave that for next week but i think that's something that we definitely need to dig into yeah and i and, I, and, I, and yes let's leave that for for next week because i can share a couple of things that we have done with that and helping those analytical minds to work with them and to work with the colors and why the colors and why the different ways you can interact in digital and paper and, and with the mind maps and why but yep. that again next week follow us where you like to listen to podcasts like us or subscribe and leave us a review you can also interact with us in personalproductivity.club mm -hmm. there is a channel and the show it's released early in ppc personal yeah. productivity club we are Augusto Pinan and Argo Weeks. See you next time on your favorite device. Thank you.